Well, good morning, Sun Baptist Church, and I'm looking forward in a few weeks for Marilyn and I to be with you, and I know we're going to have a good time because we always have a good time at Sun Baptist Church. Last week, I talked about the Jezebel spirit, and I've had a lot of comments about that. And I decided it would be a good thing to do a part two on the Jezebel spirit because you need to understand something. That letter that was written in Revelation chapter two to the church at Thyatira warning them about a woman, could have been a man, can sometimes be a man, even in our day, but he talked about a woman in the church at Thyatira whose name was Jezebel. And we talked about some characteristics of Jezebel because not only churches of the time of Christ could have a person like that, but churches today could have somebody like that. But more seriously than that, as I pointed out, any one of you or me could have somebody in our lives that has a Jezebel spirit. So I want to talk about that a little bit more today, a little bit more in detail, and perhaps answer some questions. There are three words that I'll talk about a little bit more as we go along, but I want you to go ahead and write these three words down somewhere. There are three words that describe somebody, maybe in your family, could be a man, could be a woman, could be somebody among your friends, could be an enemy, but somebody that you may have in your life that has a Jezebel spirit. And those three words are this, manipulation. If you want to write that down somewhere, manipulation. The second word is intimidation. And the third word is domination. Manipulation, M-A-N-I-P-U-L-A-T-I-O-N, manipulation. Second word is intimidation, I-N-T-I-M-I-D-A-T-I-O-N. And the third word is domination, D-O-M-I-N-A-T-I-O-N. And it's all going to boil down to this. It's all going to boil down to this. The conflicts that we have as human beings, most of the time, has to do with who's in control, who's the boss, who's calling the shots. Now, where did that come from? Because that is not a good spirit. Where did it all begin? Well, it began in the Garden of Eden. So I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, and let's see this exchange that takes place as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, 16, after God has listed some things that are going to happen as a result of the sin, in verse 16 he says this, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now the first part, any woman that's had a baby will tell you, they don't much care for Eve as a result of the curse of the pain of childbirth. Under the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And then, now remember, this is a curse. This is a result of their sin. But then here is something that seems a little bit out of place. It says, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. And I have heard some of the greatest sermons you ever could possibly believe. And (laughs) lessons from Bible. Oh, isn't this beautiful? God has established the husband and wife, marriage, first institution of God, which it is. And then they say, how beautiful. 
that the desire of the wife shall be to please her husband. Well, that sounds good, but that's not at all what that verse phrase means. When it says, look at it, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee, God established a chain of order in which in a marriage the husband would have authority. And that phrase that says, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, <coughs> excuse me, that's not a beautiful complimentary phrase. What it actually means, God is saying to the wife, you're going to want to be in charge. <coughs> you don't like the idea that your husband is ruling over. You don't like it. You don't like it. You don't want him being in control. You don't want him having authority. And so the battle of the sexes began at that moment. He says, I'm going to be in charge. She said, I don't like it a bit. I want to be in charge. And there it all started. Now, I want everybody to listen carefully to what I'm about to say. There is a vast world of difference between authority and control. God established authority, but it's to be loving authority. It was never to be a boss-like attitude. You just simply isn't. But here's what happened. While God was in control, before the sin of Adam and Eve, peace reigned in the Garden of Eden. And he said, don't you eat of that one tree. Well, I mean, probably tens of thousands of trees they could eat from. And the Bible says the serpent beguiled Eve. She ate, gave to her husband Adam, and he ate. Both of them knew. Both of them knew. Both of them knew. That was contrary to the will of God. So God could look at Adam and Eve and say, Hey, everything was peaceful while I was in charge. Now you sinned. You didn't let me control the situation. And here's what's going to happen. He says, I'm going to establish you as the authority on earth in a marriage relationship. Adam, that's what you're going to do. Now, by the way, that was a curse to him. Because if they'd only followed the will of God, peace would have reigned. Adam would not have been placed in the position of being the one that had to make the decisions. He wouldn't have rankled Eve as a result of it and his children later and his grandchildren. Oh, no. Now he's going to be an authority. He's going to have to take the blame as well as the credit for decisions he makes. And sometimes the blame is more often attributed to a person in charge than the credit is. He's going to have to take it on the chin a lot. Eve's not going to like any of it. So see, it all messed up. When they decided to sin, go against the will of God. God said, that's what you want. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you. And it ended up being a curse. Now let me ask you a question. I'm asking you personally. See it there in front of me. How many of you were raised in a family where either your mother or your father exercised total control over the family? One of them dominated. I mean, flat out dominated. Those of you that say I was raised in that kind of family, if I were to ask you, was it a good experience, most of you that raised your hands would say, no, it was not a pleasant experience. And do you know why? Because from the beginning, that's not what God wanted. He didn't want a man dominating a woman, didn't want a woman dominating a man. He wanted himself, God, to dominate both of them and then have peace. But Adam and Eve messed that up big time. And it's for this reason. Listen carefully to me. Because I'm talking about the Jezebel spirit. 
And basically the Jezebel spirit is when you have a person that enters your life that wants to control everything. They want to control everything. Everything you do. Every decision that's made. It's them. And I'm telling you now, you and I know people that we met in church relationships. And it's almost like they carried a little black book in their vest or they carried a briefcase and when they walked in, they just dominated every bit of the conversation about what we're going to do, where we're going to go, how we're going to deal with things. You ever met anybody like that? Even in family relationships, they walk into the room. The term is they suck the air out of the room because it's going to be their way or the highway. It's that Jezebel spirit that I've got to be in control. Listen to what I'm about to say. God did not create any human being to have control over any other human being. He just simply did not do it. Adam wasn't created to have control of Eve. Eve wasn't created to have control of Adam. It just simply wasn't that way. And when you have a situation, as some of you said in your mind, either my father or my mother dominated our household, the household was in chaos. Instead of bringing stability, it was constant chaos. So, let me say again, authority, authority and control, authority and domination is not the same. I understand, and you're thinking right now. The Bible by saying, wives are, Paul said it, wives are to be in submission to their husbands. That is one of the most misunderstood verses that I've ever seen in my life. You know what that word submission literally means? Let me tell you what it literally means. Submission literally means a wife is to look at her husband and to say, what is God trying to do in his life? Because as his helpmate, I'm going to help him to be successful. I'm going to think ahead. I'm going to plan ahead. I'm going to figure out what will help him to achieve best what God is wanting him to do in his life. I'm just simply going to do it. I'm going to be submissive to that. What is it God's wanting to do in my husband's life? It doesn't mean that if they decide to be a refriger get a refrigerator, that she has no word in it. Or they're going to buy a house. She has no word in it. That's not what it means at all. It, the spirit of submission, true submission, is when a wife is saying, I'm going to try to figure out what God wants to do in my husband's life and help him to achieve it. But what a lot of preachers who are sexist, that is, they just don't have much regard for a woman's opinion, what a lot of preachers leave out is the next verse, which says, submitting ourselves unto the Lord. Submitting ourselves, one to each other, as unto the Lord. In other words, a wife ought to be trying in a submissive fashion to say, what is it God's wanting to do in my husband's life? I'm going to help him achieve it. But the next verse says, a husband ought to look at his wife the same way. What is it God's wanting to do in my wife's life? And I'm going to help him to achieve it. But you see, Jezebel didn't want any part of that. She wanted everything to be done her way or the highway. Now, go over to Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, because I mentioned that. I talked about it last week. I think we ought to look at it again, because this is uh, the letter to Thyatira, one of the seven churches. And I want you to see what it says here in Revelation chapter 2, and verse, well, it begins with verse 18, done to the angel of the church in Thyatira. But look at what it says in verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants. That word in King James, 
<coughs> thou sufferest, literally means you allow it. Now listen, folks. If somebody comes in with an iron fist <coughs> and tells you to jump and you say how high, they take over a business meeting at a church. They take over a family decision. They do it. They do it because you allow it. See, that was the complaint that Jesus had toward this church. You were allowing it to happen. <coughs> You've got to understand. If you've got people in your life, <coughs> excuse me for my cough, if you have people in your life that you have said, I love them, but I sure don't like having to walk on eggshells around them, then that person has a Jezebel spirit because they are dominating you. They're dominating you. And they're going to continue to do it until you take a stand against you. You say, well, how can I take a stand? Well, I think what you ought to do is simply in your spirit, if not right out, just say, as Michael did when he was arguing with the devil about the burial place of Moses, the Lord rebuked thee. I mean, Michael the archangel knew that Satan was behind all of this. So let's look at manipulation a minute. Now let's just look at it. I mentioned it a little bit last week. Let's talk about it in a little bit more detail. Manipulation is when you get people to do what you want them to do regardless of whether they believe it's the wise thing to do or not. That's manipulation. Persuasion is when you get people to see that whatever you're suggesting is for their good and you sincerely mean it for their good. You don't have a hidden agenda and you're trying to get them to do something and saying, well, this is for your good, but actually it's for my good. That's persuasion. Manipulation is when you try to take a person or a people and move them around like on a checkerboard or a chessboard to achieve something that's going to satisfy you. That is manipulation. That is simply wrong. And the fact of the matter is, you can't be manipulated unless you allow it to happen. And that's what's being talked about here in Revelation chapter 2. And I hate manipulation. I hate it. I mean, I absolutely hate it. There is an evangelist, and I will not mention his name. You might not even know him, might not, but you might. And he's a moocher, he and his wife. If I've ever met a moocher, it, it, they've learned how to manipulate people. And uh, I remember standing at the front of the church talking to this evangelist on one occasion. And his wife and the pastor's wife were standing at the back. So the pastor comes up to me and this evangelist, and we're talking and his wife was just really dressed wonderfully. And I said, your wife has on such a beautiful outfit today. Oh, yes. And you know, the thing about it is, she made that outfit. And sometimes some ladies in the church will have her do work for them. She makes a little bit of money on the side, and that's nice. And they love her clothes better than some of the outfits they can go down to the dress shops and get. And so this evangelist yells across the empty auditorium as at the end of the service to his wife, calls her name, who's talking to the pastor's wife, well-dressed lady, and says to her, Honey, did you know the pastor's wife um, uh, makes those clothes for herself and even for other ladies in the church who come? And so... His wife says, will you make me an outfit? And so 
The pastor's wife says, well, yeah, I'd be glad to make an outfit. So the evangelist's wife yells back to the front to us and her husband, oh, guess what? So-and-so, the pastor's wife's name, I forget what it was. So-and-so's going to give me an outfit. Well, that's not what she said. She said, I'll make you one. And then she hugs her neck, said, oh, I can only know how to thank you. We've just got it so hard, and we just don't have any money coming in. And we've had all these doctor bills and all these things coming. I just want to thank you so much that you're going to give me this outfit. I'll just treasure it. Moochers. Moochers. I found out later that was a pattern they followed. Wherever they went, it was a pattern. You've seen people like that. Being manipulated. If that pastor's wife had done what we ought to do, she ought to look at her and said, wait a minute. I said, I'll make you one. I didn't say, I'll give you one. But see, she was so sweet, she allowed that evangelist's wife to manipulate her. She allowed it. Listen, folks. I know it's tough. I deal with it in my own life. Marilyn deals with her own, her own life. It's tough because there's some people you wonder, what in the world are the ramifications going to be if I stand up, look her in the face, look him in the face, and say, we're not going to be manipulated anymore. But see, the Jezebel spirit in a person knows you'd rather just cow down and go along with the game and walk on eggshells as to stand up. That's manipulation. And the second thing is intimidation. Go back, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 19. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, Ahab told his Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. And he was scared. She intimidated him. In other words, she said, you cross me and you're going to pay for it. And you have people that you've met that have tried to intimidate you. Well, that's Jezebel's spirit. And let me just tell you something about the Jezebel spirit. You can't reason with it. Elijah couldn't reason with Jezebel. You cannot reason with it. Well, maybe if I tell them this, maybe they'll understand it. No, they're not going to understand it. It's a spirit. It's demonic. They're not going to understand it. You can give them all the good reasons in the world. They're never going to accept it. Because they've got that deadly Jezebel spirit. And it's a vicious spirit. In fact, I'm just going to tell you, in my own personal opinion... That Jezebel spirit, that spirit of you do it my way or it's the highway, is very, very close to witchcraft. Witchcraft is out and out demonic. Now, I don't know how demonic the Jezebel spirit is, but it just seems to me there are some people that have this inordinate power position that's almost supernatural in their power and in their ability to get people to do things that are simply not good for them. And they shouldn't do. And with anybody else, they wouldn't do. But somehow they just sort of cave in to this person that has such a powerful personality. And I got to tell you something. You just remember this. God has given every one of you that are saved a precious gift of salvation. He's given that to you. And each person has a spiritual gift. Maybe sometime I'll talk about spiritual gifts and help you to understand what your spiritual gift may be. But every one of us, if we're saved, we've each one gotten spiritual gifts. That's a gift God gave us at salvation. For some, it's the gift of ministry. For some, it's the gift of loving and fellowship and faith and so forth. 
But the power to use that is what we call the anointing. You can have a gift, that's permanent. But the anointing comes and goes by your yieldedness to the Father. And anytime somebody comes in and gets you to do something that God has not directed you to do, you have let that person get between you and God, and the anointing is going to be taken off of your life. That's the reason we have a lot of people that I know that are saved. Yes, they're saved, but they don't have joy, and they don't have peace, they don't have happiness. They don't have an exercise of faith because they've let somebody with a Jezebel spirit get between them and God and has caused them to start doing things that are not in their best interest so they're not being as yielded to God as they ought to be. Do you understand that? I mean, a person with a Jezebel spirit can interject themselves between you and your relationship with God. And you say, well, in most things I trust God. In most things. To have the anointing of God, you got to trust him in all things. I'm not the first to say it, but I'll say it because I've heard it so often. Either God is Lord of all or he isn't Lord at all. Let me say that again. Either God is Lord of all or he isn't Lord at all. I mean, if there are areas in your life that you're cowing down to somebody with a Jezebel spirit, then that means God is not Lord as he wants to be in your life, which means you don't have the anointing that you ought to have. So somebody with a Jezebel spirit, could be family, could be a man, could be a woman, can manipulate you. They can intimidate you. And by the force of their personality, dominate you. What do I mean by dominate? We have a phrase, you hear it often now. People rent a place in your mind, and they're renting it with no payment. It's rent-free. You ever had that happen? All you can think about is that person. Can't think about anything else. All you think about is that person. And let me just talk to the person who may be listening to me, who has a Jezebel spirit. Because we may have somebody that's listening to me. I don't know it and you don't know it, but then we don't know. We really don't know the person that's seated next to me to us what's going on in their heart. But if you have a Jezebel spirit and you're trying to manipulate people, you're trying to intimidate people, you're trying to dominate people, even if it's just one person, you're trying to control them then I'm going to tell you what you've done. You've taken the place of God in their life. You put them in a position where they're listening more to you, and not only will God withhold his blessings from them, he's going to judge you harshly because you become a God to them. But there's something else. It'll destroy what you could have had. Now, particularly, is this true in the home? I want you to look with me to Psalm 133. It's a very precious psalm. And I'll give you a moment to find it. Psalm 133. And the Bible says this, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now remember, I've told you before, you can have union without having unity. When I was a boy, me and my buddies, we didn't have toys. Didn't, we were too poor to have any toys. But our neighbor had two or three big tomcats, and we did on an occasion take some grass string, and you have to be old to know what that is, and tie the tails of a couple of the tomcats together and throw it over a clothesline those cats had union, but they didn't have unity, and we got a kick out of watching them fight. So you can have union without having unity. This is how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that run down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended up on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord 
commanded a blessing, even life forever. Gave them a blessing. He commanded a blessing because they had unity. I mean, it would be the worst of circumstances if Marilyn said to me, it's either my way or the highway. On everything came up, she had to be the boss, equally. It'd be the same way if I said, it's either my way or the highway, and I'm always going to be. I mean, that would be ludicrous. You wouldn't be living together in unity. You simply wouldn't be living it. And I wonder how many marriages there are where they have union, but they don't have unity. I mean, I asked you that question a while ago. How many of you had a family situation where either your father or your mother had to dominate? had to control everything. It'll destroy unity. And notice that Psalm 133 says, God brings the blessing when there's unity. Brings the blessing when there's unity. And I'll tell you something else. For those who know you, and especially your children, having a Jezebel spirit destroys the image of God. Remember, how I started it out. I didn't start it out with a reference to Jezebel in 1 Kings or Jezebel in Revelation 2. I started out in the Garden of Eden because you had God in control. And because of the curse, that control was turned over to Adam and Eve. Now there's going to be this constant struggle. If everything had been left alone and Adam and Eve had never sinned, peace would have reigned. Now let me tell you something. I want you to listen because this is going to be something you're going to have to go home and chew about when you think about it. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, God is not in control of anybody's life. Not anymore. You have control of your life. Even if you're saved, you have control of your life. You have control. You're not going to stand before God at the judgment and say, I couldn't help myself, unless you're a Calvinist. That's one of the reasons I'm not a Calvinist. They say you couldn't help yourself. That if there's Child molestation, that was the will of God, which I think is ludicrous. That sin couldn't happen if it weren't for God. No. You are in control. Now, you have a spirit, but you also have this old carnal nature, and they're constantly in conflict. Paul says we are to be a bond slave. That means we are to be a slave to God, which means in every situation, that we have to make a decision about. We ought to say, God, what is it you want me to do? And I'm going to do it. But the decision, day by day by day by day by day, to let him control a particular thing is our decision. Thanks to Adam and Eve. But if we want to live a glorious life and a pleasing life, we have to constantly, day by day by day, Live in a yielded spirit and say, God, you bought me, you paid a ransom for me. I don't want to control my own life. I want to day by day give it to you, and you have to do it day by day. If you're not careful, the circumstances of life, you'll fly off the handle and say something you ought to do. You wouldn't have done that if God controlled you. Everybody would go to heaven if God controlled everybody. He doesn't. We will answer to God about the decisions we make. The wise person will refuse that Jezebel spirit. They will neither manipulate nor be manipulated. They will neither intimidate other people or be intimidated themselves. They will not dominate other people nor be dominated themselves. Let's flee in our own lives and the lives of others, those with the spirit of control. Do it my way or else. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day and the lessons of the moment. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>